Hebrews chapter 13. And we'll get to that in a moment. Just keep your fingers there and have your cell phone ready uh, there in Hebrews chapter 13. This week I was reminded of a song by a group we all know very well, or most of us, the older ones here, uh, the Bee Gees. Anybody know the Bee Gees? A few heads nodding, yes, yes. And I was thinking of a song that was particularly popular, I think, in the 1970s. Uh, words. Remember it? Words. Smile, an everlasting smile. A smile can bring you near to me. Don't ever let me find you down, because that would bring a tear to me. And then listen to this. This world has lost its glory. Let's start a, start a brand new story now, my love. Isn't that what Jesus came to do? Right now, there'll be no time and I can show you how, my love. Talk in everlasting words and dedicate them all to me. And then the chorus. And I will give you all my life. I'm here if you should call to me. You think that I don't mean a single word I say. And then... It's only words. And words are all I have. That's the thing. To take your heart away. And in some ways that is a pastor's predicament. And what God has done for us is given us his word. And if you look at it from a human perspective, it's only words, but if you see the heart of God and what God has done through those words, it's a different story altogether. It will take your heart away. Now Hebrews chapter 13 deals with the evidence of biblical faith. It tells us what saving faith looks like in the lives of God's people. And we've already seen the first part of this evidence, uh, enjoyment of spiritual fellowship. That's the first one, verses 1 to 6. And that involves love, hospitality, care and concern. Marriage is honored in that context. Sexual purity is held in high esteem. And commitment uh, to or contentment about material things most certainly is high on the priority list. The second part of the evidence for saving faith is submission to spiritual leadership. You remember what we spoke about last time. Remember your leaders. Obey, submit, and greet, to them, and greet them also. Now the third evidence is sharing in spiritual worship. Now I remind you, this letter was written to backsliding Jewish believers who were tempted to go back to the old way of worship. Judaism seemed so solid and secure to them. Herod's temple was still standing in Jerusalem and all the temple rituals were still in full swing. They were being offered. The bride was going on on the bronze altar. And... The incense were burning in the temple and people had to bring their offerings at the right time. So everything was still going on. And the pressure for those Christians were from family and friends to conform and to participate in traditional Jewish culture. And that pressure was enormous. But what those believers did not know at the time was that Jesus' prophecy in Matthew chapter 24 was literally knocking at their front door. Judaism was about to receive a devastating blow and that would change it forever. That was Jerusalem and Herod's temple. Their destruction 
was near. Remember Jesus' words, Matthew chapter 24, verses 1 and 2. Jesus left the temple. They were there uh, together as a group of his disciples. That was about, probably about 35 years before, and it was before he died on the cross, but he, he already intimated what was going to happen. He said, Jesus left, the, uh, it says here, Jesus left the temple and was walking away when his disciples came up to him to call his attention, his attention to its buildings. Now, that temple must have been a very impressive building in those days to those people because they were obviously talking about it and pointing to it and calling Jesus' attention to it. Look, Lord, look how fantastic this building is. It's so solid. It's go- it stands. Nobody will ever be able to destroy it. And then Jesus' answer comes in verse 2. He says, do you see all these things? He asked. I tell you the truth. Not one stone here will be left on another. Every one or every single one will be thrown down. And that literally happened. And it is still so. When they excavated there in uh, Jerusalem, they found those stones that that temple was built with, and they, not one was standing on the other. And it was about 70 AD when General Titus and his part of the Roman army marched into Jerusalem and destroyed that temple completely, knocked it down. Level. And his army pursued the Jewish folk, especially the zealots. And they fled up to to Herod's mountain fortress, there close to Jerusalem, to hide there, to, to find a place of safety. And it was an impregnable fortress because, well, it was safe because you couldn't reach it. It was very high up. You couldn't just walk up to it and and attack it. So all these people were up there on that mountain, just over a thousand of them. And Titus and his army besieged Masada. And those people on top there held out for about a year. Nobody could come down, nobody could go up, no food could go in, no water could be delivered. The Roman army brought all meats to Masada. And in the end, it got so bad, as I said before, mothers ate their own babies. It was a terrible time uh, in Jewish history. And then in the end, they all committed suicide, mass suicide, on Masada. Now the writer to these Jewish Christians in Palestine writes at about 67 AD, three years before these events took place, just, uh, just before them, and he wants to persuade these backsliding believers that Jesus Christ was by far the better way. He reminds them that he is far superior to the angels, right there in chapter 1. Far superior to Moses, to the Old Testament prophets, to the Levitical priesthood, and the whole Old Testament sacrificial system. In fact, the whole thrust of his message is that these things were only dim shadows, temporary earthly examples and weak symbols that pointed forward to the real thing who had come already at that time. In the year 33, uh, 30, 30, he had come and he died in 33 AD and he died as a, as a sin offering uh, for all these people. So he had already come. And the question was, who was this reality then? The far superior, the perfect fulfillment of all these shadows. It was God himself who came, veiled in a human body, it was the Lord Jesus Christ. And think about it. He was in perfect fellowship with his Holy Father, 
this eternal Son of God, the Word who became flesh and made His dwelling among us and became the perfect, complete, sufficient sacrifice for our sin once for all eternity. So those old things were not wrong, but they were fulfilled in Jesus Christ. They spoke of the reality that was still coming, and then he came, and the Jewish folk missed this completely. And the Christians who saw this were under pressure to go back to the old things, to conform to the old things. He was the full and final revelation of God the Father, Hebrews chapter 1 says, who came to us in human form. I want to tell you, as that song goes, Jesus, oh how we should rejoice at the mere mention of that wonderful name this morning. Now while it's true that New Testament Christians are not involved in the ceremonies and furnishings of an earthly tabernacle anymore, it's not that Christians are deprived of the blessings that they typified. A Jew under the Old Covenant could point to a physical temple. And as I said, those buildings were very impressive. So impressive that the Lord's own disciples were absolutely amazed at them. And also that those first century Jewish Christians wanted to go back to that way of worship. But now God's word reminds us that believers under the new covenant, sealed by the blood of Jesus Christ, sees by faith the heavenly sanctuary that will never be destroyed. Those Jews were so proud of their precious city, Jerusalem. But we are citizens of the eternal city, the new Jerusalem that will never fade away. And the point is, that for each of these temporary, physical, earthly items uh, an Old Testament believer could look at and point to, a New Covenant believer sees by faith the heavenly and eternal counterparts, the real thing, in other words. And it would be for that reason absolutely senseless and mindless sacrilege, blasphemous, you want to hold on to those old weak shadows while we possess forever the eternal spiritual realities through our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you see that? Do you understand that? Imagine, Jesus appears here today and he stands here, right? I've used this illustration before. And he comes and he stands here and all that we know about him, we're very aware of that. And, and he's glorious and he's wonderful. The right thing would be to worship him, isn't it? Here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down, to say that you're my God. But now, imagine there's a light shining from that side of the sanctuary, this building, shining on Jesus. And the shadow falls on that side on that wall there of Jesus Christ. It looks like Jesus because it's Jesus' is shadow, but it is not Jesus. Jesus is the real thing. How would it be if we all fell down and worshipped the shadow instead of Jesus? That would be utter folly, you see. Now, this is what we have here. Those stubborn people were holding on to the examples and the shadows of the Lord Jesus Christ. And they refused to come to him personally. In fact, someone with saving faith will never want to do a thing like that. In fact, not knowingly or willingly. A new covenant believer, cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ, a possessor of the gift from God called saving faith, shares in spiritual worship 
and have nothing to do with dead earthly ritualistic ceremonies. Although it astounds me just how easily we can fall into the same trap sometimes. Sometimes we can also become experts in holding on to weak shadows. For example, last time we saw that it is sinful to want, want to hold on to the pastor or any human for our spiritual well-being. Christ is the object and subject of our faith. Never man, yet people run after other people. Whoa, so and so is speaking. He's our pastor. It's almost like a worship there. No, no, no. And what about music? Hey, some people feel unless the band is in full swing and we have everyone here and the band is just perfect and the music is just right, we can't worship. But as Bob Coffin says, the American, he says, music is great, it's wonderful, but Jesus is greater, you see. That's the point. Or sometimes people are tempted to hold on to a word from the Lord here and a confirmation there, a teaching about this and a teaching about that. The one says this and the other one says that. I had to counsel a young man over the phone in, in Johannesburg. Rachel connected him with, with me and this guy was totally confused because of this. But he says this, and he says that, you know. And we do the same thing. We try and hold on to the scraps while we have the real thing, the full and final and more sufficient revelation from God. We have him in our homes, on our shelves, on our bedside tables, on our tablets, on our computers, our phones. And hopefully we have, have this final revelation open before us. All you need to do is to open your Bible and to pray, prayfully read it and study it for yourself. And as you rely on the Holy Spirit, He will show you Jesus. You will hear Jesus speaking to you. And you will see Jesus, more and more of Jesus and His glory. As you look at the pages of scripture. The Bible is the complete word. This is the real word. This is the sure word the Holy Spirit uses to, to reveal God's Son and His will to us. I don't know if you've ever thought about this. But this is also the final standard by which every other message or word or whatever must be measured. Let me tell you where the word is honored. We have no need for all sorts of bits and pieces and interpretations and messages and strange teachings and doctrines and weak shadows anymore. Because where God's final revelation is really honored, God's people are enlightened and they are strengthened by grace and they grow. In maturity. I've seen this happen many times over the last 30 years of ministry I've been involved in. So allow me to say the same thing again. Forget the shadows. That preoccupation with those things that seem so sensational and so attractive and so exciting dished up as Christianity in our day. I want to tell you that those things are not what they seem to be. But the word of the Lord stands forever. Jesus said so himself right there in Matthew chapter 24. If you go to the end, you'll see his words there. And then we also like to look back to the old ways, don't we, Sometimes. 
Somehow we find a sense of security in tradition. And tradition is not necessarily bad, but tradition can lead us away from Christ. We so easily become content with the rut of ritual, thinking we've done our bit for God by merely going through the motions. Pray, read, church, sing, lift our hands, sit, listen, give. Hey, if we did that only, I tell you, we would get fit in no time. But anyway, yeah. Well, the Bible makes it clear that God wants us to worship him in spirit and in truth. Salvation and eternal life is not the observation of dead religion. It's having a real intimate relationship with the triune God through Jesus Christ, the Son. Hey, I'm reminded of those well-known words of Jesus in John chapter 4. Those words to the Samaritan woman at the well at Sychar, a sinful woman. John 4, verses 21 to 26, puts it this way. Uh, Jesus speaking to her, and he says, Yet a time is coming, and has now come, when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshippers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshippers must worship him in spirit and in truth. And the woman said, I know that Messiah is coming, called Christ. When he comes, we'll, he will explain everything to us. And then Jesus declared, I who speak to you am he. Someone who has saving faith shares in spiritual worship with God's people. And they worship God in spirit and in truth. By the Holy Spirit and through the Bible. With a true understanding of who God the Father is in the face of Jesus Christ, his glorious Son. So sharing in spiritual worship means firstly that we approach the spiritual altar. In fact, without this spiritual altar, it's not possible to share in spiritual worship. This is what verse 10 implies. Just read there with me. Hebrews 13, verse 10. We have an altar from which those who minister at the tabernacle, that's still the temple, that is Judaism and its followers, have no right to eat. Now I remind you that this altar we have is not a material, physical altar, like the one the Jews had in the Old Testament times. That would contradict the message of this letter. This spiritual altar we have, uh, again, uh, that we have is again very special. Uh, <clears throat> and he is the only way to God, our Father, if that, uh, if, if that is if we want to worship God. The Old Testament altar was a shadow or a picture of the spiritual altar. It reflected some truths about the real thing. You remember from previous messages and from reading the Old Testament yourself that the bronze altar in the outer court of the tabernacle and later uh, uh, on the temple, in the temple courts, was a place where the blood sacrifices were offered. As I indicated earlier on, the idea of Bri definitely did not originate here by us. But already in the Old Testament times, where the smoke continually went up from the bronze altar. But then there was also the golden altar. It stood in the holy place before the veil that, separate, that separated the holy place from the most holy place. It would have been like this. Uh, we have the outer court here and the entrance hall and then the holy place here. Well, we don't call it that, but just to 
to show you how it worked. And then there would have been a curtain right down the front here. And behind the curtain would have been the Ark of the Covenant with the mercy seat on top, you see. The bronze altar was outside. Maybe where our bra is. I don't know if you've ever seen it. Probably. That was the bronze altar. People brought their sacrifices and they were offered up there. The golden altar stood in the holy place, in front of the curtain that closed off the most holy place from the holy place. And what did this golden altar mean? Incense was burned continuously on this altar. A wonderful picture of how the the prayers of believers ascend to God. Psalm 141 verse 2 says, May my prayer be set before you like incense. May the lifting up of my hands be like the evening sacrifice. So there's the bronze altar with its blood and meat offering. And then the golden altar with its sweet smelling incense in the church and they are symbolic Jesus died for our sin the golden altar in the temple our prayers before the holy God a sweet smelling incense but who is the New Testament Christian's altar well, who else can it be but our glorious Lord Jesus Christ you see, some people may set aside places in their church buildings or homes and call them altars. But they are not altars in the biblical sense. Why not? Because Christ's sacrifice for our sin on the cross has already been made. Once for all time and eternity. And the gifts we bring to Almighty God are acceptable spiritual offerings in His glorious presence not because of any earthly altar, but because of this real altar, the heavenly one, Jesus Christ. It's Jesus. It's about Jesus, not other stuff. So I want to ask you this morning, have you come to Jesus in this way, this altar today? Jesus is the only way to eternal life and the only way into the presence of God the Father. Nothing else can bring you there. No other sacrifice. No other observation of anything. Only Jesus. Have you come to him in that way? It all hinges on that. That is what Christianity is about. If we add our own rituals and our own works to that, to earn our salvation, we've lost the plot. Baptism can't save you. That comes after someone is saved as an outward sign. The communion, observing communion, that can't save you. That's not blood. That's not the body of Christ, really. It symbolizes the body of Christ. So it reminds us of what happened in what Jesus did for us. It's about Jesus Christ, and he alone saves. Now let's read verses 11 to 14. The high priest carries the blood of animals into the most holy place as a sin offering. That uh, was on the Day of Atonement, once a year. The veil would be there. Uh, the Ark of the Covenant would be behind the veil with the mercy seat where the, where the two angels' wings touched. Right in between there, that symbolized the presence of God. So once a year, the high priest would come in and sprinkle the blood. He would go into the holy place with fear and trembling, not being sure that he would escape the ordeal, and he would sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat on the altar uh, of, or on the Ark of the Covenant. And then God would come 
and turn away his wrath on the nation for the next year uh, in that context. So the high priest carries the blood of animals into the most holy place as a sin offering. But, and this is the emphasis here, the bodies are burned outside the camp. And so likewise, Jesus also suffered outside the city gate. That's outside Jerusalem. To make the people holy through his blood. Let us then go to him outside the camp, bearing the disgrace he bore. For here we do not have an enduring city, but we are looking for the city that is to come. Now the emphasis here is on separation from dead religion and personally identifying with Jesus Christ and the disgrace and the reproach he bore. Remember the readers of this epistle were looking for a way to continue as believers while escaping the persecution that would come from unbelieving Jews. The answer was easy. Compromise your faith a little, just a little. Surely God wouldn't mind if we worshipped in the temple again with his people, just a little bit, offering up all those sacrifices and worshipping all, all, through all those rituals. It would make life a lot easier for us. Well, if you have saving faith, you know that that can never be. Following Jesus will cost you something. Sometimes it will cost you everything. And the pressure is always on to compromise your convictions. To compromise your relationship with the Lord. Especially with people who are close to you. Family, friends, work associates. We are tempted to compromise our commitment to Christ daily. Because of cultural pressure. Financial pressure. And just plain old peer pressure. You just don't want to be left out. You don't want to look weird. So Christians sometimes join in. But believer, don't you know by now that this world and its systems, that is religious, political and financial, are doomed for eternal destruction. Therefore separate yourselves unto Christ. Commit yourself fully to the Savior who died for you. Love him with all your heart and then there will be no room for compromise with anything. Look at what it says here, verse 13. Let us then go to him outside the camp, bearing the disgrace he bore. For here we do not have an enduring city, but we are looking for a city that is to come. Hold on to the people and things in this world ever so lightly. But embrace the things of eternity with all your heart and mind and soul and strength. Sharing in spiritual worship means that we should first of all come to Christ, our spiritual altar. But the saving faith not only approaches the spiritual altar, it offers spiritual sacrifices and we're almost there here in verses 15 and 16 we find two spiritual sacrifices christians should offer to the lord and note the word spiritual does not stand in contrast to material because material gifts can be acceptable as spiritual sacrifices so the word used here, or the word used here for spiritual, means something that is spiritual in character, or something that is useful for spiritual purposes. For example, Romans 12, 1 and 2, we see that a believer's body presented to God for his exclusive use is a very spiritual sacrifice. So the first spiritual sacrifice mentioned here is continual praise to God. Verse 15. Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God 
a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that confess his name. Those words of praise that comes or come from our hearts and flow from our lips to the Lord is like beautiful fruit on the altar of the Lord. It pleases him greatly. But how easy it is for suffering saints to grumble and to complain. And I don't think God is pleased with that. Because grumbling and complaining comes from an unbelieving heart. In fact, the Lord saw an oath in his wrath against the Israelites that they would never enter his rest when their grumbling and complaining displayed their unbelief for the tenth time at Kadesh Barnea. How important is it for us to count our blessings every day and to give thanks to the Lord? Let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise. And then saving faith shares in the good works of sharing. Verse 16, do not forget to do good and to share with others. For with such sacrifices God is pleased. Now this was addressed to believers probably in Jerusalem at the time to make a corporate effort to do good and to share with others. So the onus is, is on us as a body of believers together to seize the opportunity of the day and to make a lasting practical difference for Jesus Christ in this sin-infected world that we live in. James 2 verse 27 gives us good guidance here. It says, Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Do not forget to do good, that's verse 16, and to share with others. For with such sacrifices, God is pleased. Lastly, saving faith deeply desires to pray for others. Intercession, verse 18. The writer to the Hebrew says, pray for us. We are sure that we have a clear conscience and desire to live honorably in every way, I particularly urge you to pray so that I may be restored to you soon. We need to pray for one another.